All right, it's four o'clock. Uh, this is the, the final talk of the day. We're glad we had you all here. Uh, Lola and Sashi, Lola Baladin and Sasha Barnaby are gonna to speak to us. So go ahead and start. Hi everyone, my name is Lola Baladon. And my name is Sashi Barnaby. And in the spring of 2020, we were in a computational problem solving class where we created our site reading music generator. So Sashi has an open lesson tomorrow morning, but instead of practicing her um, piece all week, she decided to practice sight reading instead. Um, so sight reading is for musicians. You must be able to you must be able to know how to read music to be able to sight read. It is playing music upon first sight. Um, it's usually unfamiliar music, so you've never heard, played, or seen it before. Um, and there are many tools for um, musicians to be able to sight read. What Sachi used was our program. So for, um, you press start here for it to start. For our program to work, it must pull from a third party software called MuseScore. Um, we have provided the download here. Um, it is completely free to the user, so they do not have to pay for anything. Um, so our program works for both Windows and Macs. And because of this dual functionality, the program needs to know where your um, where MuseScore is in your computer. So you must copy and paste in the file path to your um, to this um, typing bar so that you can start the program. So we're gonna use Windows because we're on a use, um, Windows computer. Once you press the Start Here button, it takes you to our main menu where you can choose from many different options to um, customize your music. Um, you can choose from what key you want, whether you want it to be a major or minor key, the time signature, what instrument you want to play, what clef you want to be, whether it's treble or bass clef, and the level of difficulty that you want to use. So after you're done, you press the generate music button. Um, Sachi chose to play bass clef, but, um, well, oboes can't play bass clef. So as you see, our program automatically fixes it and takes it back to treble clef. So if you pick an instrument, but you pick a clef that it can't play, it will automatically change it back to you. So now we're going to see what Sachi has been practicing all week. So that was great. Um, we want to see if Sachi has played that correctly. Sorry. You could drag it down to the bottom of the screen. Okay. So as you can see, she did a great job. Um, there are more functions that um, our program can do, including changing the tempo, which is just how fast the music is played. So if you double the tempo, it will play twice as fast. So as you can see, it played twice as fast. You can also um, press the stop button and it will stop anywhere on the line of music and start again from the beginning um, once you press play again. You can generate new music with the same parameters that you used before. And after a while, I'll give you this new piece of music which sounds different from what you had before. You can play it. So as you can see, it's completely different from before. Um, lastly, you can return to the main menu using the return to the main menu button where you can choose an, any parameters you want again. And then you, you can do whatever you want. Um, when you're done, you can just press the red X at the um, top right to um, exit the program. So then our first step when we were creating our music generator was to make a melody. Our first task within this was to create scales within Mathematica. Um, scales are just a series of eight distinct notes that are um, common and well-established -estab patterns in music. Um, as you can see here, we uh, we had our, um, our program create uh, eight different notes, and then we also have the numbered one through eight. 
um, which is mostly for our reference. Um, once we built these scales, we used um, each of the notes to build chords. Um, so we took the, the note of the scale and then stacked two more notes on top of it to create a chord, um, which uh, means we have eight distinct chords as well. From this, we researched uh, common chord progressions in music, and chord progressions are just um, different orders of the chords that create a foundation for a melody. Um, so you can see here, a one four five one is a very common chord progression in music, and um, again, this created a, a basic a foundation for our melody line. Um, so we, it, with these um, small chord progressions that we researched, we put them each into lists and then had our program um, randomly pick from these smaller chord progressions to create um, a larger one. And uh, we also wanted to make sure that our larger chord progression started and ended on a one chord. Um, so to make sure that it started on a one chord, we prepended a one to the beginning of our larger chord progression list. And each of the smaller chords, um, we made sure ended with a one so that it would also end on a one. Um, when we had our final chord progression list, um, again, that's a series of all of these common chord progressions. Um, we had our program randomly pick one note from each of the chords within the chord progression to create a basic melody line. So now that we have our melody, we wanted to make sure that it followed basic music guidelines. So a cantus firmus is a simple melody that follows a set of rules. The main rule that we had to work with was leaps. Um, a leap is any interval of four or more um, in between two notes. So an interval is the number of lines and spaces in between two notes, including the lines and spaces that the notes are on. So for example, this would be a leap of two, as this note starts on this line, giving it the first interval, and the next note, and it goes up to the next note, um, one space, giving it the second interval. So one, two. Um, here is an example of a leap um, with four lines and spaces in between. One, two, three, four. And so the rule with leaps is that it must resolve in the opposite direction of the direction of the leap. So for example, this is a leap up, so it must resolve one step down. And um, in another example, this is a leap down and it resolves one step up. Um, our, the problem with this was that the correctly resolved note was not always in the next chord of the chord progression. And that's against the rules, so we had to fix that. Um, we did some research and we found that you could repeat a note to um, make repeat the note that was left to to resolve correctly. However, this made our music very boring and repetitive. So we added embellishments called neighbor tones. A neighbor tone is just a note that is a step up or down in between two repeated notes. So for example, this is a um, this note steps once up from this note and it re um, goes back down to the repeated note. This just made our music, our melody more interesting and complex. So now that we had our basic melody established and had a few embellishments in it, our next step in making our music generator was to create rhythms. Rhythms are just specified amounts of time that are assigned to each note. And uh, we wanted, in music, um, rhythms are all proportional to each other. So we wanted our um, assigned value lengths to reflect that in Mathematica. Uh, for instance, here, um, this is a quarter note, um, which is a very uh, common um, rhythm in music, and so we assigned it a value length of one in Mathematica. Uh, one quarter note is equivalent to two eighth notes, so we gave each eighth note a value of 0.5. Um, we had a couple other rhythms we wanted to use, including the dotted quarter note, which is equivalent to three eighth notes in music. Since each eighth note is worth one, uh, 0.5, the dotted quarter is worth 1.5. Um, and then here also we wanted to use triplets. Uh, three triplets are equivalent to one quarter note, so we gave each triplet a value of one third. Once we established the um, time values for each of our rhythms, uh, we also wanted to organize our music properly so that it could be notated and played correctly. Um, the main distinction we had to worry about was compound versus simple time. And um, this refers to uh, the time signatures, which are two notes um, usually at the beginning of a piece of music and that ex um, show the musician how uh, music is going to be um, organized in the piece. So in compound time, um, the time signature usually has an eight on the bottom and um, it can be sub each beat can be subdivided into three eighth notes. Um, in simple time, uh, it's usually often notated with a four on the bottom and each beat can be subdivided into two eighth notes. So um, this is great for notation, but it also um, sounds a little bit different uh, in music. Um, so we have an example here. 
Uh, this first example is in 6-8 time, which is a compound time. So there are three eighth notes for each beat. Um, and uh, it should be noted each of these are eighth notes. Um, so then the second example is in 4-4 time, which is a simple time. Again, each of these rhythms, there are only eighth notes in this. Um, and there are two eighth notes per beat. Um, so the takeaway is, of course, that uh, the simple time signature sounds much slower than the compound time signature because there are fewer notes per beat. So once we had our um, time signatures different, we also wanted to make sure to produce rhythms by the beat and by the measure. So what this means is that um, on both of these levels, there's a specific amount of time that needs to pass. Uh, for instance, again, in this 6-8 time signature, um, each beat is worth 3 eighth notes for a total of 1.5. In this uh, simple time signature, each beat uh, can fit 2 eighth notes, so it has a value of 1. Um, when we're referring to by the measure, um, this uh, compound time signature has three, sorry, two beats of three eighth notes, each for a total of three. And conveniently, this time signature has three beats of two eighth notes each, which also totals to a time value of three. Um, so the main way this showed in our program was that we had to make sure to pair notes correctly when they're being randomly generated, um, or rhythms when they're being randomly generated. So for instance, uh, triplet, no other um, value that was paired with the triplet would equal the total amount of time um, except for triplets. So triplets could only be paired with triplets, while as eighth notes and quarter notes could be paired together to equal the uh, correct amount of time. Our next step was to combine these notes and rhythms. So we have a randomly generated set of notes that formed our melody, um, and it was in a list. And then we also had a list of um, numbers which represented the time values for the rhythms, again, randomly generated, but following a few rules so that it would fill the correct amount of time. Um, in some cases, there would be more notes than rhythms, but we decided that the notes created the foundation for the sight reading, so we would just uh, generate more rhythms to pair with the notes. When there are more rhythms than notes, though, um, we decided to also add in rests. Rests are specified amounts of time um, of silence that are equivalent to rhythm values. For instance, a quarter note is equivalent to a quarter rest, which means that the quarter rest has a value of one, just as a quarter note does. So um, the rest could be interspersed throughout the melody line, um, but sometimes when there are extra rhythms at the, um, at the end and each of the notes already had a rhythm value, we also wanted to make sure that um, because the rhythms were produced to fill up a specific amount of measures, a specific amount of beats, um, we couldn't just delete them. So we used rest to fill um, in at the very end um, all the leftover rhythms. So, as all musicians are not on the same level and they want to practice different levels of sight reading, um, we created levels in our program to make it more complex and user friendly. Our levels are mainly divided up by whether or not um, they have rest and the number of measures that are in the line of music. So our first le level is rhythm only, and um, in this level it's the same note throughout, so whatever key that you picked in the first note of that key will be the same note that is played throughout the entire line. The rhythms vary, but and it has rest, and it is only four measures long. Um, for the second level, it is our easy level. Um, there are varying notes, but the rhythms do not vary. They are all eighth notes. Um, there, are also, there are no rest in this level, and it also has four measures. Our third level, which is medium, has varying notes and varying rhythms. Um, but there are also no rests in this level, and um, it is eight measures long. And our last level, which is the hard level, has everything. It has <laughs> varying notes and rhythms. It has rest, and um, it is 12 measures long. So, sorry. for our program to work, um, it has all of the necessary things it needs to create the music. Um, so after it randomly generates the music, it creates a sound file. But that's not great for user interaction. So we need a sheet music notation for um, the user to be able to read the music. For um, sheet music notation, we use the third party software as mentioned at the beginning, MuseScore. And um, our program takes a sound file, also known as a MIDI file, and it sends it to MuseScore. MuseScore processes it and notates the music and then sends our, um, sends our 
sends the notated music back to our program, which is also why it takes a while for the music to load. We want to, um, this is the um, code used for that. We want to thank Austin White, a former Gatton student, for helping us. Without him, we would have not been able to do it. So, yes, thank you. So, um, because we're interacting with MuseScore, which is, again, a third-party software, uh, we could only really use basic commands um, to interact with it. As you can see here, we exported our MIDI file out, um, we had MuseScore process it, and then we just imported the PDF that MuseScore produced. Um, however, in the MIDI file, we could make any specifications or instructions for how to notate the music. So MuseScore automatically notated everything into 4-4 four -four time. So as you can see, when you try to um, pull up our main menu and you try to do, say, 6-8 time, um, any level, and you generate the music, um, it takes a moment as it's pulling from MuseScore. But you'll see in the top left here that it still notates it in 4-4 four -four time, even though I specified 6-8 time. Um, so although the music is n not able to be read in the time signature that um, was specified, the sound file is actually still correct um, because of the work we did to make the rhythms proportional to each other and to differentiate between time signatures. So for all you Slacky musicians out there, you can use our program to practice. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? You, you might consider seven, eight time. It has a nice rhythm to it, you know, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. You might see what that does. That would certainly be a challenge to sight read for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, oh, I'm not sure if they can hear me. Uh, one question I did have is, so if you do like change the instrument uh, and then you like play it, uh, will it actually kind of make it like simulate the sound of the instrument wherever Yes, um, actually it will. I can show an example here. So if you choose a different instrument, let's say piano, since it's already on there, <laughs> um, it will actually sound like a piano. We made sure our program play, um, chose the instrument that you wanted to play. What does the, uh, I forget if one of this says is, but how much does like the difficulty like affect the, the sheet music given? Uh, so we can show an example um, of some of the other um, difficulties because um, I think we were really only showing um, easy examples. Um, let's see here. So if we return to main menu and we do, let's say the hard level, um, there should be uh, varying notes, varying rhythms, and rests included, um, oh. and it's longer. Okay, whoa. Okay. Okay, thank you. Of course. All the little parts you played were very, very pleasant. Does it ever come out that you get something that's unlistenable? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, um, because we followed the rules, it all, they usually all sound pretty great. I think um, one of the things we just did for fun when we finished our program was um, had it do like a hundred measures of music, and it was it was it sounded okay. You know, it's yeah. it's not like anything I would want to sing in the shower, but but it was it was pretty fun. <laughs> have you shared this with the music department, or? I don't think we have. Um, it was I've been using it actually. I have practiced a few times with it. Of course, I'm limited to four four time, but um, yeah, it's it's been a it's been a fun thing to add into my practice routine. Are there any more questions for the speaker? We've still got a little time. You mentioned that you would use rest to fill in the remainder of the the last measure if there happen to be rhythms left over, like if there are more rhythms and notes. Is it possible for the program to do the opposite where it generates more notes than it has available rhythms? Um, and if so, how do you make sure that the melody still resolves correctly? Do you want me to take this one? Okay, 
So um, let's see, the first part of the question is uh, whether or not we can add in more notes. Um, I'm assuming you mean it when uh, like there are extra rhythms left over and we just wanted to add more notes to it. Um, in theory, our program could do that because um, we just had it run a loop um, to create or to pick the random small chord progressions to add to the main one. So if we just had it run, you know, uh, one more time so that it would um, pick more notes, it, it could do that. Um, but we had it where uh, once our melody was finalized, we didn't uh, want to add any more notes, um, especially um, well, that we were just using as melody is king sort of thing. Um, so we always had the, the rhythms catered to the melody. Um, so I think although it's possible in our, uh, possible with the code that we have, we had it so that it wouldn't do that. Did I answer both parts of the question? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Could you play your example? Yes. You, you might experiment with experiment with with different genres of music uh, the the, the so-called rules that uh, say classical music versus jazz are, are various uh, would be somewhat different and you might uh, take your software and, and design it for different types of music that would definitely be an interesting application I know the jazz rules I think would probably be um, pretty complex so that would, that would be a, that would be fun to, to explore. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, let's thank the speakers, a fine talk. <laughs> and I hope you've enjoyed the symposium. <laughs>